no matter where you live in the world, chances are high that you've come across and uncomfortably looked away from a homeless man or woman. Whether that be on freeway off-ramps, on the street, or in a public park, their presence is felt all over the world, even in the harshest of climates. While objectively, this person is no different from anyone else you've encountered on a daily basis, many people are made uncomfortable by their presence in any given establishment. According to the Ruff Institute of Global Homelessness, people experiencing homelessness face discrimination and exclusion as a result of their housing status. This is reflected in their interactions with general society, city legislation, law enforcement, and even the healthcare system. Homelessness sits at the nexus of stigma, isolation, and vulnerability. Though homelessness can be highly visible, passerby often ignore individuals or subject them to stares, reinforcing their outsider status either by making them invisible or making them visible only through negative attention. The outsidership renders people experiencing homelessness vulnerable to acts of violence, exploitation, and extreme social isolation, which can create barriers of stable housing and employment, as well as trigger or worsen mental health issues. Fear of stigma may lead some individuals, especially youth, to keep their housing status secret, hindering their ability to enroll in services or find housing among their social networks. It may also keep individuals from entering public spaces where they may be subjected to ridicule, harassment, or staring, further marginalizing a population that already struggles with meeting the basic human needs of food, clothing, and shelter. Though many people would never venture to say so, they view homeless people as dirty and unworthy of respect, as if they were somehow less than human. They applaud when major cities introduce designs to make it impossible for them to find a place to sleep, and yell unhelpful reminders of their poverty at them. And that sentiment was certainly held by the men who we will be talking about today. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of Brian Racine, and the ridiculous reason his life was taken away from him. This case was suggested by multiple subscribers, one of whom reported that they knew Brian and also struggled with homelessness, and it is my hope that this video is to their liking. If there is a video you would like to see made, or a case you are interested in knowing more about, let me know either by leaving a comment down below or emailing me at dreading.official at gmail.com. I'm still working my way through all of your suggestions, slowly but surely, and if I haven't gotten to yours yet, know it is coming. This video should be uploaded around the first anniversary of this channel, and as such, I want to say thank you. With all of that said, let us begin. Brian Racine was described as the type of person who would give the shirt off of their back to help another person. While many would praise this deeply caring quality in Brian, it hurt him more than it helped him. Brian dealt with mental health issues, and they often left him struggling to take care of himself. He didn't value himself the way he valued other people, and if he was made aware of another person's struggles, he would immediately do whatever he could to help. This included giving money to anyone who would ask, shirking his professional responsibilities if someone asked him to, and simply not prioritizing his own wants and needs. He would give away everything he had to others, truly keeping nothing for himself. After failing to refill his prescription one month, Brian made the decision to move from California to Utah and join the Church of Latter-day Saints. He believed this would provide a new, healthy start for himself, that he was being called to work with the church, But as is often the case, the impulsive decision did little to benefit his life. When Brian arrived in Ogden, Utah, he was originally staying in a home with other people. He would never join the church, and it seemed like he never even attempted. But shortly thereafter, Brian would move out of the home and become homeless. Brian quickly learned how dangerous homelessness can be, and how people tended to look through the homeless when he was out and about. It was like he was a ghost, winding his way through the world, unseen but still felt. He began to stay in a homeless camp with other men and women in the Ogden area. There, they shared food and resources and protected each other. He was made aware of the dangers of sleeping on his own and felt safer staying with the rest of the group. It was said that Brian had also befriended a stray cat who often slept on or near him for warmth. However, less than a month after being homeless, Brian's life would be taken in horrific fashion. Dalton Aiken and Corey Fitzwater were two men who didn't have much going for them. Fitzwater was 35 years old and considered himself to be an alpha male. He often spoke about how he wasn't bound by society's rules and structures, having gone to war in Afghanistan and killed, by his estimation, hundreds of people. He talked openly about how strong and powerful he was, and over time, a small group of men formed around him, taking his teachings as gospel. One of these men was 27-year-old Dalton Aiken. By contrast, was not an alpha, 
but he wanted to be. He looked up to Fitzwater and began to center his life around the things the older man had told him to do. He wanted to be seen as strong, desirable, and cool, and felt that, by modeling his life after Corey, he could achieve that. As time went on, the relationship grew on its own. The two men bonded over their love of weed and hatred of homeless people. Whenever the two would hang out, the topic of conversation would always reliably be brought back to their mutual dislike of the homeless and how they felt they were the scourge of society. They viewed anyone who lived on the street as being less than human, ultimately too lazy and stupid to take care of themselves. They weren't people, worthy of respect or basic kindness. They were worse than animals, and they deserved to be ridiculed. Oftentimes, the pair would mock and harass any homeless man or woman they came across, intimidating them with threats of physical and sexual violence. The pair had harassed Brian multiple times, and Brian had believed, when he joined the homeless camp, that he had found some semblance of safety but he didn't account for how terrifyingly disturbed Dalton and Corey were. On August 16th, 2018, Corey and Dalton had spent the night drinking, smoking weed, and shooting tin cans at a property owned by Corey's parents. This is something they had done numerous times to blow off steam, and according to their statements, it made them feel alive. There was something powerful about shooting in the dark, and they often talked about being vigilantes like Batman. What the fuck? However, this night was different. As the men continued to shoot tin cans, they didn't feel as powerful as they usually did. Instead, they felt as if their shooting was purposeless, like kids playing with an imaginary friend. They wanted to do something big and impactful, something that would better their lives and the lives of those around them. And so, in their drunken, stoned haze, they decided that they would kill some homeless people in the area. Again, they viewed the homeless as a scourge of society taking up space and resources that could be put to better use. They were lazy and stupid, and for that crime, Corey and Dalton determined that they should die. The pair quickly formulated a plan. They went to a homeless encampment on 21st Street Pond, smoked more weed to settle their nerves, then made their way through the brush. One of them wore a ski mask, hoping to shield their identity. However, when they arrived at the camp, they found that no one was there, save for Brian, sleeping peacefully on the ground. One of the men shot Brian directly in the head, killing him instantly. The pair then sprinted away, high and laughing, nicking themselves on the trees and brush. However, they didn't get very far. Dalton and Corey expected the murder to go unreported, hoping that the other homeless men and women in the area would cover it up. If the crime was reported, they expected it to either go unsolved or for another homeless person to be blamed, which they were more than comfortable with. Either way, they thought they would get away scot-free. But again, that's because they were idiots. Immediately after the two men killed Brian, multiple people called the police, reporting hearing gunshots near the homeless encampment. Responding officers were on the scene in minutes and found Brian's already deceased body. But before the pair had even made it back to their car, they were already being pursued by the police. Officers had pulled up to where the vehicle was parked and saw that there was a hefty amount of weed visible on the front seats. They waited until the pair made their way out of the woods, expecting to arrest two stoners who had simply forgotten to hide their stash. When the two men made their way back to the vehicle and began to drive away, they were pulled over. The officers noted the smell of weed in the car and asked the men what they had been doing. Their response prompted the officers to search the vehicle, where they found a significant amount of weed, a 45 caliber gun, and a black ski mask. Dalton was also found to be carrying 45 caliber bullets in his pocket, and the men were immediately brought in for questioning. Though Dalton and Corey had successfully left the crime scene, they were basically caught red-handed. While separated in police custody, they would have to come up with the same cover story as to why they were in the area of the encampment, with a gun that matched the gun used to kill Brian. This would be borderline impossible for a career criminal, but for two morons who had spent the night drinking and smoking a large amount of weed, it was a gargantuan undertaking. However, at the beginning of their interviews, still under the influence, they both believed they would be able to properly come up with a reasonable explanation. The following is Dalton's police interview, which was done mere hours after the murder. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, let's throw the bag and stuff and everything else in the garbage. Perfect, thank you. You want a punch or not? Uh, no, I'm okay on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's fine. So, I've got a few things I would like to quickly talk to you about. You are obviously in custody. So, uh, go ahead to the Miranda before I can do that for you, okay? So, you have the right to remain silent. And you said we're against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have a present with you while you're being questioned. If you can't afford to hire a lawyer, I want to be able to present you before any questioning if you wish. You can decide at any time to exercise these rights and not answer any questions or make any statements. Do you understand each of these rights I've explained to you? Yes. 
Having these rights in mind, you should talk to us now. Uh, talk to you? Yeah, me and the detective. Yeah, I got nothing wrong with that. We're simply looking to get your side of the story, what's going on here, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, you know, that's we, it, have, yeah. We, have, we haven't heard what you got to say yet. So. I can't do that until we get through that part, so. Um, let's just start off. What will you tell me about what was going on this morning? Let's see. I got pulled over and I had marijuana. Okay. What about before the traffic stop? What were you, what was going? What were you doing? Oh, we were walking at the park. By the park, you mean like the pond and the trail and all that? Yeah. What do they call it? Uh, the old Indian place where the rivers meet. I'm familiar with that? Got a fancy term? Do you know what? Yeah, it's right there where Dogden and the Weaver River meet. Oh. But you're, so you're on that, that, that whole trail complex that's back there behind the one you went in. I think I know where you went in to where you go across the bridge and the road goes, the trail goes up and down both ways, right? Okay. Yeah, so let's see. So if you cross that main bridge at the parking lot mm -hmm. and then you just kind of keep going straight ish and then it curves to the right. Yeah, right there where the two rivers come together. Yeah. Okay. All right. And you were with. Who are you walking with? Corey Fitzwater. Is he family friend? Yep, family friend, exactly. What makes this interrogation so interesting is the fact that Dalton is incredibly open and compliant with police, due in no small part to the fact that he isn't fully aware of what is going on. They gave him a sandwich and some water, so he's good to go. Had he been brought in completely sober, he would no doubt be an emotional wreck. He has just been found with a gun that was used in a murder in his possession, but you would never assume that from the way he's acting. This makes the interrogator's job incredibly easy. When interrogating a suspect like Dalton, a considerable amount of time will be spent trying to put the suspect at ease and gain their trust. But in this case, that is completely unnecessary. This could also potentially get in the way of his interrogation being admissible in court. Because if it's found if he wasn't fully cognizant of what was going on, this interview could be seen as unlawful. Late. We just got done busting up concrete for his neighbor um, with the sledgehammer, so we were kind of having a good time, you know. But I, I think it was, I think it was two to three. Okay. We're talking like a.m. Right? Uh huh. You guys working that late busting concrete too? Well, we only bust the concrete till about 12. The most useful tool any interrogator can use is silence. In conversation, silence is uncomfortable. It makes people feel uneasy, as if they are being judged unfavorably. And most people will try to avoid that feeling as much as possible, usually by breaking the silence themselves. Watch how uncomfortable it is as I sit here in silence while you stare at your screen. See? If you want further examples of this, next time you ask someone a question, wait for them to respond and then go silent. Keep your face neutral as if you expect them to continue, or as if you don't believe they're finished talking. In most cases, that person will continue to speak, adding details to whatever they said. This is helpful in interrogations, as they are trying to get the most information they can out of the suspect. By making them uncomfortable in this subtle way, they can get more information out of Dalton which will help them dismantle any lies he chooses to tell later on. Pay attention to how many times the officer goes silent and how Dalton reacts. They had it jacked up and they were trying to bust it and it just would bust off a little piece every time. So we just started going to town and it just all went. It's good um, therapy, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, where's the neighbor? Where does that live at? The what? Where was that at? Because you the concrete. Uh, so it'd be Kitty Corner in his backyard. The word just so neighbor of its neighbor of Corey's. Yes. Where does Corey live at? Uh, by Hobie's. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so you guys are busting concrete. Um, okay. So what I'm talking about, I'm not worried about. The marijuana like that. Okay. That's all I've been interviewed for. So you guys break concrete. You guys normally go to the river to so I'm assuming happens to go there for you to drink beer, smoke a blunt, and exactly. walk quite beautiful out there, right? Yeah. Okay. 
Is that something you guys normally do? Like, no. Like, a thing for you? Yeah. We usually just hang out. This is objectively a very stupid thing to say, given the situation. Stating that going to this spot to hang out and talk was an unusual and uncommon thing to do would add further suspicion. It's incredibly hard to believe that on the night where a man was murdered in cold blood in the area, these two men just so happened to decide to go on a walk there with a gun that matched the one that had been used in the murder. They had never gone there before, but on the night they did, a murder just so happened to take place? It's highly improbable. But again, Dalton doesn't realize the gravity of the situation. The police have brought up the murder themselves, and Dalton is likely not allowing himself to dwell on it at this stage in the interrogation. How far did you guys walk around the trail? I think I had the freeway in sights, at least. Like, when you start, when you take that turn off in the distance, you can see the freeway. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see anybody else on the trails or? Yeah, a couple of times. Other late night revelers or transients or what? Uh, campfires. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I would assume transients. Huh? Right. Forgive me, I think he's on the knows area better than I do. So you guys park in the direction. So when you first say you're walking, are you going east? North, how does that trail split off? You can... Yeah, so it'd go, um, let's see, that would be south, and then it heads to the west. Okay. So, and how long, so you guys get there, you think around two to three? Um, yeah. How long do you guys are out there for? Uh, enough to smoke a little, basically. Sure. Hour, half hour. I know it's hard to tell time, but half an hour. Do you guys hear any commotion or anything out there? Well, I kind of have a feeling that I know what you guys are after. Like, did someone get killed? I mean, so I heard a gunshot for sure. That's just that it vibrates, let us know it's still working. Imagine you, completely innocent, went out to smoke some weed with a friend. While smoking on a hiking trail, you hear a gunshot. This is obviously alarming, as you are high and in a dark, wooded area. You'd be on edge, and if you didn't call the cops yourself, you would be aware that police are on their way. When you get back to your car, you are immediately arrested and are found with a gun on you. No matter how high you are, you would likely immediately understand that your arrest has something to do with the gunshot you heard, and address that at the beginning of the interview. I was out smoking weed with a friend. I heard a gunshot. This is who and what I saw before and after. Any other questions from the police would likely be met with some hostility, as you had nothing to do with the crime, and were simply at the wrong place at the wrong time. Any implication that you were involved would be insulting. But when Dalton brings up the gunshot, he is completely unbothered, as if it's an afterthought. The sentence, I think I know what you brought me in, I did hear a gunshot, is way too casual of a statement considering the circumstances. The idea that someone shot a gun near his person on a trail he was on should be upsetting to him. The concept that someone died in his vicinity should stand out, but he is completely blasé about it, which is highly unnatural, which is not uncommon for guilty parties in these circumstances. They will act completely unaffected and neutral about horrendous information in order to try and appear innocent to the police, not realizing that it has the opposite effect. Where are we having heard the gunshot? I mean, relatively speaking. So when you start heading towards the west, there's like a weird vinyl fence. Like if you, they got voltage up across it, you're not supposed to cross it. Well, it's about right there. Um, I think it's a junkyard if you cross the fence right there. What did you see, hear, smell after the good shot? Uh, nothing. Yeah, just that's it. What did you guys do? Um, well, we're kind of country. I guess we didn't even pay no mind to it, to tell you the truth. I thought it was weird to late, but yeah. Did you guys just continue on your way? Did you start? Okay. No, sorry, I missed it. So, I mean, did you guys continue just walking the direction you're going? Did you guys. 
Yeah, we, t we turned around about when he hit that fence with the voltage, and you can see the freeway. Okay. Just walk back. When you say by that fence, does that mean you were by the fence, or that's where you heard the shot? I was by the fence. You were by the shot. If, where did you hear the shot? If I had to pinpoint the shot, where it came from... place, HVAC place, uh, Mountain Valley Mechanical, mm -hmm. I bet you that's, I think, where. What direction is that from where you're at? <sighs> Let's see. It's right on that hard turn where it says 15 miles an hour. That's where um, I think it probably was. Okay. Because um, that's where that Rocky Mountain Mechanical is. Mm -hmm. So... You say you were by the vinyl fence and you heard it by the hard turn, so you think it was to the north of you then? Let's see. So, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so how much longer were, so you hear the shot, you guys finish whatever you're doing to get back to the car, how long do you think that took? 20. 20 for the hike back. Uh, probably not even that, pretty close. Okay. It's hard to be exact out there. Then you guys immediately got in the car, started and left. Did you guys hang around the parking lot for a little bit? No, we just left, got pulled over real quick. <laughs> Didn't take long. Did you guys go on to any of the camps while you were down there? Mm -mm. You like the homeless people? Mm -hmm. Uh uh. We actually never came face to face with any of them, just there's a time. Just through the fires? Mm hmm. Do you know any homeless people that live out there? I do not. Sometimes I kind of look like it. <laughs> So next question I have for you is, the firearm that they found you with, that six hours, is that right? The what? The gun you had in your car? Uh-huh. Where did you get that? I'm sorry, I missed it again. The what? The gun you had in your car. Oh, yeah. Where, where did you get that? So that's Corey's. Okay. Do you know how long Corey's had it for? No clue. Did you guys take that with you when you were doing your walk? No, I had some bullets in my pocket from earlier, but so we were shooting it earlier, but we didn't take it on the walk. Where were you shooting it? Uh, West Warren. His uh, parents and law a pretty good pad out there. Just lots nice. of country, just all oh, yeah. freaking good nice. targets. Yeah, it's awesome. Was Corey's gun? Was that Corey's ammo too? Yeah. Yeah, I actually tried. Uh, we were going to make a trade. Um, I took him my Universal 30 caliber carbine Universal. So we were just on a gun kick, kind of on a trading thing. Did you going to trade the carbine for the. I was thinking about it, but he never could talk me into it because it's my my uncles that made, uh, there's a PT cruiser that's so fancy at Frank Mares in Lagoon. I, but I've got kids, I should go down there, but I don't. 
but he built it, so it's kind okay. of close to me. Yeah, it's in the middle of that. Yeah. So you guys are on any camps down there? You don't know any? Were you and Corey together the whole time? Did you guys ever break up to go take a leak or for anything? I guess there were a few leak breaks, probably. Yeah. But no, we were pretty much together. So, when you guys were separated for whatever, you know, going to take a urinate or whatever, did Corey leave you? Did you leave Corey? Um, I think I left him once and he left me once. I mean, not leave. Right, but out of sight. Yeah. To go do your business. Anything else that was going on out there that you think might have been weird or odd or struck your senses is kind of... Yeah, the whole night, man. Like, uh, it just gave me a bad feeling. Right. Sure as heck showed up as a bad one. Did I like, articulate that at all? Like, what do you mean? Uh, I mean, kind of like the Holy Ghost, I guess. <laughs> just someplace you shouldn't be right then. And the bolt chain pocket, those are unfired rounds. Correct. From, like we do, you just throw 50 rounds in your pocket and go to the load layer out there. Yeah. What was Corey thinking about? Saying anything? How, how was Corey last night? Yeah, he, he was upset. He uh, his wife was accusing him of cheating on her, which he claims for sure hasn't. Um, but it makes him think that she is. That's what he told me. So yeah, we were we were venting that night for sure. I was kind of there for him. How was Corey? He's upset. Is he uh, calm? Is he? Get a little he, angry. It, he gets a little angry, but I think it's his uh, war stuff. His um, Iraq PTSD. I think he's retired. Uh, he's retired and he's like 30 years old. He's got a purple heart. Can't be convinced for that. Yeah. It sounds like it didn't come cheap, obviously. You know Corey's wife pretty well. Yeah. Are you married, kids? This is Corey's life. How old are you? 20, turning 28. How much learned yet? Still gonna enjoy it while you can. Okay, so an area of concern or question that we have. So you guys were there. How do I want to work this? We find in life, especially place where coincidence doesn't occur a lot. Usually if things happen and they seem tied together, they're most likely tied together somehow, right? Uh -huh. So would there be any reason why we would find a spent shell casing that matches the gun you guys had at the scene of what we're investigating. As the confrontation begins, Dalton crosses his arms over his chest and begins to breathe a bit heavier. 
which could be associated with stress. The entire interview up to this point, which has been about 15 minutes, has been easy. He thought he skillfully played off the potential accusation well by being the first one to bring up the gunshot and stating that they heard it but had nothing to do with it. But now the officer informs him his story doesn't make a lot of sense. He nods along, seemingly resigned to what is happening. I'm going to come clean right now, okay? Thank you, because the forensic evidence tells us a story. You're, you're not helping yourself. Okay. Um, so Corey did leave, and that's when I heard the gunshot. And that is it, man. Yeah, that's not it, man. Had this been the case all along, this would be the story he went with originally. He went to go smoke, Corey left to pee, I heard a gunshot, Corey came back, we left. As a reminder, the gun is Corey's, but Dalton had bullets in his pocket and was the person holding the gun when they were arrested, which indicates to some degree that he was there when Brian was killed. It's clear he wasn't trying to lie for his friend or provide an alibi, as he gives him up at the slightest pushback. But had he really not witnessed anything, he would have said as much at the beginning. Dalton, realizing the serious nature of the crime, is now trying to distance himself as much as he possibly can. The police gave him a slide out earlier in the interrogation, asking if he or Corey left the trail to pee at any given time, to which he said yes, but he seemingly is unaware of how little his story makes sense. And that's when we left, because I knew something bad happened, but he didn't say nothing. How would, how did he seem after? Calm, I guess. Like, like, you know, you could have been friends for a while. Uh-huh. Okay. Did his, so post, when you're saying he left the gunshot and after, did he seem more relaxed? relaxed? Uh-huh. circumstance now if what you're telling us is the truth mm -hmm. you're telling us you come clean you're telling us this is the truth yes uh, you yeah I'm, I'm you, you, I'm need to, to, you need to get off any thoughts of protecting Corey okay okay when we ask okay. him questions and we're and, and things like that well I don't want to drag these out of you you need to give us all the details this is not a short story this is a long story right okay so a short detail like oh, I walked away I heard a gunshot I thought something bad happened there's a lot of shit that went up before you walked away from him there's uh -huh. a lot of stuff that went on after you are thinking about you now uh -huh. if you're telling us the truth uh -huh. you're not protecting Corey anymore right because if you're not a witness what are you uh, let's see what would it be a, what are they, a bystander something no like uh, yeah. no we call that police work a suspect Oh, okay. Suspect and or accomplice. Do you want to be a suspect, an accomplice, or a witness? Well, I didn't do anything, so I don't want to be any of those. The detectives don't believe that Dalton was not involved, but as he has already admitted to lying in the first half of the interview, they want to gather as many details as they can now. Those details will then be used against him further on in the interview. Dalton doesn't realize it, but by simply admitting he lied in the first place, he has implicated himself in this crime and will not be leaving. No, no, what you want to be is a witness. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you don't want to be a accomplice. You don't want to be a suspect. You want to be a witness. Yeah. Now you could you have the potential to be a very good witness, mm -hmm. or you could be resistive and not share with us all the details, which is going to make you an accomplice. Uh -huh. Does that all make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Sure. So when we ask you things, even if, if don't don't short don't short the answers, and also mm -hmm. if we don't ask details and you have details, share them because you don't want anything to do with the end result of a man dying, right? Yes, exactly. You understand, witness, it's a good role. Okay. Accomplice means you share punishment with the actor and themselves. Uh-huh. The courts don't differentiate. Yeah. If he shoots somebody out of there, and I, even if I know about it, and I don't do anything, I'm an accomplice, and I share his prison sentence. Mm -hmm. so okay. You don't want to be that guy, right? Correct. And I knew nothing about this. So like, let's go back. Okay. You guys just didn't randomly be walking down a trail. He walks around and just decides to shoot somebody. There's something that led you guys to that camp. And that's why I brought up his uh, wife still. Because mm -hmm. I think really that's what it is. Because I can't think of any reason. Okay. Well, he, he wanted you to take him down there. Yeah, who picked the spot to go? Uh, I always knew it. Yep. Yeah. Because I grew up in Marius Slayerville. Yep. Yeah, but I'm saying you guys, what, what led you guys there? Tonight. We know you know the spot. What led you there last night? Yeah, marijuana. So were you going to buy marijuana? No, we were smoking it. 
Okay. So, so the cops found my bag. So here, here's the story that I'm kind of I'm kind of getting from you, and, and and if this is what you're going to go with, I, yeah, it's not going to be good for you. Okay. You're going to say that you guys randomly showed up at a random spot to randomly smoke some marijuana, ran into a random camp, and shot some guy. Ah, oh, yeah, that sounds bad. Yeah. No, I'm thinking what happened was uh, there was a reason you guys went there. The guy, the, the guy that, that that was there, you knew. Or Corey knew. Well, wait, wait. Okay. Corey or you knew he was there. So you guys went down there to deal with that. Now I understand you not wanting to be involved in the actual process of it, but there's something that led you guys to that spot. I refuse to believe you. I mean, that Corey just randomly picked some guy and shot him. Start with the truth, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of being serious. I think that's what happened. I think he literally just shot the guy. I mean, I know that sounds bad, but literally. That's a hard sell in a, in a court of law. Yeah, it is. When you're on the stand and we're trying to convince the jury that, no, no, Dalton didn't have anything to do with this. Oh, okay. I got you. It's uh, his PTSD stuff. I don't think this is the first time it's happened. But I think it's something to do with that. Okay, so right. what did Corey say before he shot the guy? Uh, nothing. Like, it was... What made you separate from him? He went uh, off the trail and I followed him. And he shot the guy. So you were there? Yeah. Okay, that's, so that, that's one thing we want to make clear, that you guys didn't separate. You saw what happened. Yeah. So Probably due in part to the influence of alcohol and drugs, Dalton admits to lying in the interview again, saying he witnessed the murder firsthand, and that Corey just shot Brian for no reason. He's completely unaware of the implications of admitting this, and will continue to believe that he is working with the police on solving this crime, rather than implicating himself as an accomplice to this murder. Because, because to say that he randomly walks away from you and does this, you he walks off the trail towards a camp. Yeah, and I does he him. say something about going to that camp? Is he pissed off at that camp? No, he sees it. Okay, but no. So you guys walk towards this camp, and it's random. You say Corey doesn't know this guy. Yeah. You don't know this guy. Yeah. So you walk into this camp. Did they say anything to you? I think the guy was sleeping. To okay. tell you the truth, so the guy's in bed sleeping. Is where's he at? Uh. On the ground. He's sleeping on the ground? Yeah. Is he in a tent, under a tarp, in a, uh, just laying on the dirt, a sleeping bag? Just just the dirt, I think. Okay. I think. So yeah. tell me, so when you follow according to the camp, kind of tell me about the camp a little bit. Okay. There was, it was kind of hard to see because it was dark, dark right? yeah. and his fire looked like it pretty much went out. Okay. Um, but there was a big tent by it. Okay. So there's a big tent there. Uh-huh. And you walk in, and you think he's asleep. I don't walk in. He's asleep outside the tent. He's on the ground. That's what I'm saying. When you walk yeah. into the camp, do you believe he's asleep? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And what does Corey say? He kind of mumbles in like a drunk talk, like, how are you doing? Corey says that? Uh-huh. Okay. Is he drunk? Yeah. He probably was like 10 deep. Probably. Ten beers? Uh-huh. Okay. Plus, have you guys smoked marijuana uh -huh. that one? Yeah. Okay, so we've got marijuana and beer in it. You say mumble something. Uh-huh. Okay. Yep. yep. And, and to the guy. To the guy. Yep. And then what? Shot him. What did you guys say anything to him? I don't know. It's almost like I, I just didn't want. You know what I mean? And so I don't think I looked when he shot him. Okay. But if I had to guess... Somewhere here. Okay, so he shoots him somewhere in the upper body. That one. Uh, then he takes off running, and I don't know what else to do but run to, I guess. Okay. Get in the truck, get pulled over. Okay. The forensic evidence on the scene doesn't tell that story. Okay. The things that we can prove don't tell me that, don't tell us that story. Okay. okay. There, was, there was more to it. Okay. So you, I'll, I'll try, I'm going to quit dragging shit no, out of you. No, seriously. You need I'm, to tell us okay. okay. I'm trying. I really am. Because there's more to it. But you need to understand that, that when we ask you questions, a lot of times we already know what those answers are. Yeah. Okay. And if you, and, and when, you when you leave things out of the story, makes it makes it look bad for you. Okay. So we need to stop that. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So. Where'd you want to know? Because I thought I, I want to know the truth is what I want to know. But I yeah. know what all the I know what all the evidence is. I okay. know what the forensic evidence tells us. We know a lot of this story already. 
Uh -huh. I want you to tell me that story. I want you to be honest with me and be a witness to this, not a suspect. No, I just left that scene with CSI. Okay, yeah. I know exactly what happened there. Yeah. Okay. So he said there's more to it than just running yeah, away. Because a lot of the things you're telling us. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I took off running. He took off running. We. Lo I lost him. Okay. And I got to the truck and I had to wait for him for 25 minutes. I'll bet you. Um, that's probably the part that was miss missing, huh? Well, I wouldn't say so. And he said he ran into more people and fought him with his fists. Okay. So more stuff happened in the camp. Uh, that was away from the camp. That was somebody else's no, in camp. camp. He's asking you. He's, he's making a statement to you. More stuff happened in the camp after the shooting happened. That's what we're trying to get the truth about. You guys, didn't oh. walk, you guys didn't walk in banging and run away. There was more to it than that. I promise you, yeah. I, I really do promise you. All right. Tell you what. I really do. Tell you what. We're going to give you a few minutes to think about it. Okay. okay. Now, I don't want you to tell me anything that's not true. Okay. If you're telling me the truth, you stick to your story. For sure. But I don't believe your story. So okay. I want, we're going to give you a few minutes to think about how you want to proceed here. And we're going to come back in, and you're going to tell us the real story of what happened out there. Okay. Now, if it's the story you've already told me, fine. That's going to be your version of the truth. Okay. Unfortunately, the evidence is going to, tell, going to point that that's not the truth. Oh, man. But, if it, but I don't want what you to happened? lie to me. Okay. I, right? I promise okay. that. Give us a minute. Okay. Yeah. This is where the footage that was made available to me ends. The footage of Fitzwater's interrogation has not been made public, but from the transcript that was available in the court documents, he blamed Aiken, stating that Aiken took his gun without him knowing and shot Brian on a whim. Both parties blamed each other, and given that both men's fingerprints were on the gun and the bullet, either one could be telling the truth. However, the case does not end here. While the two men were in jail awaiting trial, Corey Fitzwater came up with a plan to get out of prison. He would meet two younger inmates at Weber County Jail, where both he and Aiken were being held, and take them under his wing. As he did with Dalton, he led them, teaching them the ins and outs of prison life, and convincing them that without him, they would be killed. After successfully getting these men to feel indebted to him, he told them that he had come up with a plan to get them all out of prison relatively quickly. Fitzwater told the young men if they spoke to their lawyers and told them that they had heard Aiken bragging about committing the murders, they could get their sentences reduced for working with police, while he would be let off the hook. But, obviously, that plan didn't work. When the two men came forward, and said that they heard Aiken admitting guilt, they were grilled on all aspects of the story. Where had he said this? What was the context? What did you say in response? Would you be willing to wear a wire and speak to him again? And for each question, they had different answers. It became clear after a small bit of pressing that they were lying, and the information wasn't used in court to clear Fitzwater's name, but instead added on to his sentence. As for what happened when Brian lost his life, there is a widely agreed-upon theory. That is, that after a night of drinking, Fitzwater began to brag about the lives he had taken while in the military. According to his friends and family, he often boasted about this, stating that only a real man knows what it's like to take a life, and therefore, he is manlier than everyone he knew. Wanting to impress his masculine friend, Dalton agreed to kill someone, and it just so happened to be Brian. Either man could have shot Brian, but at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter who pulled the trigger. Brian lost his life for no reason. He was a man struggling, and was as good as any other, regardless of his living conditions. Both men are in prison, sentenced to 15 years to life. If you have made it to this portion of the video, thank you for watching. If there is a video you would like to see, let me know in the comments down below, or email me at dreading.official at gmail.com.